the biological world around us is evolving constantly. As viruses depend totally on the cells of their hosts for replication, to a certain extent viruses and their hosts have co-evolved. Yet some viruses, particularly those with RNA genomes, have the potential to evolve millions of times faster than their hosts. Despite their minimal set of genes, viruses are incredibly diverse, a property which increases their opportunities for survival. Viral diversity is the consequence of evolution, and evolution is driven by the process of natural selection, also known as selection of the fittest. We are only beginning to understand the selective forces that drive virus evolution and the emergence of viral diseases. It's difficult to know for sure how and why viruses have evolved. They are far too small to see using conventional microscopes and they do not leave fossilized records similar to those of plants and animals. Nevertheless, studies of their ecology and epidemiology combined with comparison of their genetic sequences by phylogenetic analysis can provide a picture of their evolutionary history. Additionally, comparisons of their protein structures with those of other microorganisms and higher forms of life can provide clues as to how viruses may have originated. Viruses aren't like dinosaurs. They don't live great big pieces of bone around that transform into stone with patterns on them. With viruses, you've got to find a way of identifying those records of the past. And the way this is done is roughly equivalent to the way forensic medicine is done. What you do is you determine the genetic sequence of the virus and then you compare that sequence with other virus sequences. And when you do this, of course, what you can do is to create a family tree. And the family tree is a historic record of the evolution of these viruses. As you start to look at these sequences and compare them with each other, you find that many parts of the sequence are shared between viruses that are related, and even there are some common features with less closely related viruses, but obviously there are less common features. But these are effectively the fossil records of the viruses. Um, one of the other features you notice is that many times you'll find the same element or sequence element repeated over and over again. And this is because these, we now know, these are the building blocks for the nucleic acid, the RNA or the DNA, the building blocks from which all these viruses evolved. Viruses are absolutely dependent on living host cells for their replication. In some cases, they can co-evolve with the hosts, not causing overt disease in their hosts and sharing the same fate, either surviving or becoming extinct. Alternatively, viruses may occupy broader niches, infecting a number of different host species and causing disease. There are many examples of viruses that effectively cross the species barrier. The obvious advantage is that if one host species becomes extinct, the viruses may still circulate and thus survive amongst other species. This last type of evolutionary pathway is quite common for RNA viruses. The process of evolution is wholly dependent on genetic variation. As in cellular forms of life, viruses evolve through the selection of genetic variants, which arise during the virus replication process. A variety of possibilities exist by which genetic variation may occur. These include point mutations, sequence deletions, duplications, insertions, recombination, and in the case of viruses with segmented genomes, gene reassortment. Mutations usually result in single nucleotide changes. 
Generally, RNA viral genomes show a much higher mutation rate than DNA viral genomes. Because the RNA polymerases do not have proofreading activity. Errors are generated in RNA genomes at an approximate rate of 1 per 10,000 nucleotides copied. In contrast, most DNA polymerases have the ability to correct errors and therefore, in general, DNA viruses evolve at much lower rates than RNA viruses. During RNA replication, the high error rate of the RNA polymerase results in large numbers of progeny genomes with point mutations. Thus, RNA virus populations contain mixtures of these variant genomes. These variant or heterogeneous populations are usually referred to as quasi-species. Can you imagine in a football ground, when you look at humans, you don't see 50,000 identical humans. You see 50,000 different humans. In a population of RNA viruses, you don't actually have just one virus. You have millions of viruses, many millions of which are different from each other. So you have a, a, a mixture of variants in a population. And when the pressure comes, the selection pressure comes, this a different mosquito uh, uh, is, is infected, so it needs a different property. Or a different vertebrate host is infected, so the virus needs to have a different property. All those properties are already there in the population, and all that has to happen is one of these variants has to be selected. And this can happen instantly. So quasi-species populations ensure that the virus is always able to provide the variant required for the environmental conditions and the selection pressures under which it finds itself. Point mutations are only one of the means by which genetic variation may arise in RNA viruses. During the normal process of RNA replication, the polymerase enzyme moves along the RNA template, copying the RNA sequence. However, because this enzyme is prone to error, it may become detached from the template and subsequently reattach at another position, for example upstream where it continues copying from the new position of attachment. In this case, a section of the original genome will be duplicated in the subsequent copy. Alternatively, if the polymerase reattaches downstream, a section of the genome will be deleted. In other cases, the polymerase might even reattach to a different RNA molecule within the template pool. Then it might return to the original template, resulting in a section of the different genome being inserted into the original template. In a few cases, this type of insertional recombination may occur several times along a single genome. Alternatively, the polymerase may remain on the second template until completion of the genome. This error-prone nature of RNA polymerases can also explain how RNA viruses may have originated from primitive RNA. In primitive RNA molecules, the sequence may be very basic with many repetitions. However, the combination of mutations, insertions, duplications and deletions introduces diversity, leading ultimately to very complex and different sequences. Virus diversity can also evolve by means of two distinct but not mutually exclusive types of genetic exchange. These are recombination and segment reassortment. As we have already seen, recombination is the process of genetic exchange between two different RNA templates. During RNA replication, the polymerase may switch from one RNA template to another. If these templates are different, the product is a new genome, displaying genetic properties of both parents. Hence, if a cell has been infected by two virus strains at once, and recombination occurs between the two different RNA templates, then the resulting genome will inherit genetic properties from both viruses. Recombination can occur in RNA viruses that have either non-segmented or segmented genomes.
Genome segment reassortment, on the other hand, occurs only in viruses that have segmented RNA genomes. It involves the exchange of one or more entire RNA segments. For example, if two different strains of influenza virus infect a single cell, it's possible for one or more of the segmented genes to become mixed so that an entirely new combination of genes arises, thus producing a new virus. In the case of influenza A virus, this process of genetic exchange is widely documented and referred to as antigenic shift. On the other hand, genetic changes in influenza viral genomes can also take place over a period of time due to the accumulation of mutations. This process is referred to as antigenic drift. Viruses that arise unexpectedly to cause epidemics that were previously unrecognized are often referred to as emerging viruses. This may occur if a virus population changes its natural vector host range. Alternatively, increasing human population density, increased mobility and the need for expansion into rural areas often results in increased exposure to known or even so far undiscovered viruses that circulate in wild environments. To understand these host virus interactions, we can define four possible scenarios. In a stable host virus interaction, the virus is maintained in the natural ecosystem. This stable form of interaction only rarely results in fatal disease. Evolving host virus interactions may arise when viruses that have circulated for many years in a stable host virus interaction are introduced into immunologically and genetically naive populations, often but not necessarily in the same host species. Dead-end host virus interactions occur when the chain of virus transmission is broken. For example, yellow fever virus may be transmitted to a human by an infected mosquito. However, despite the fact that this human may develop a clinical infection, the virus is rarely, if ever, transmitted to another mosquito, and thus there is no chain of transmission between humans. Finally, the resistant host interactions are those in which the host may be completely immune or genetically resistant to infection by a virus. Immunity may arise either because the host was previously infected by the particular virus or because the host has been vaccinated against the virus. Resistance may arise for a variety of reasons, all of which are based on genetic selection. For example, the resistant host may not possess suitable cellular receptors for virus infection to be initiated. Or the resistant host may possess a specific resistance gene that prevents virus replication. Host populations change, especially humans. Modern sanitation has hugely reduced the incidence of many infectious diseases in the developed world. However, humans go to places they have never been before, where they can come in contact with potential new viruses, which could cross the species barrier. Today, humans travel the globe, and in that way, provide new chances for viruses to spread and evolve. Global travel also means that viruses can come in touch with naive populations and cause devastating diseases. Viruses such as influenza can reassort in animals and a resulting human infection could have severe consequences. Global warming is also an important factor when it comes to the spread of emerging viral diseases. Animals that usually prefer a warmer habitat find new niches in previously colder climates. And with the animals, such as mosquitoes, come viruses. Over millions of years, viruses have evolved the genetic diversity to infect the cells of every type of living organism. The viruses that we isolate and study in our modern laboratories are the direct descendants of these more ancient genetic lineages. 
During the past few thousand years, human population densities have increased significantly. Consequently, our capacity to alter the environment has had a major impact on the evolution, emergence and dispersal of viruses. While we are now beginning to understand many of the properties of viruses, we are also inadvertently creating new possibilities for virus emergence and thus disease. Clearly, new challenges lie ahead if we hope to match the continuing ingenuity of viruses.